first question everybody asks me, who is the so system? Because we're not at the show. Most people have never heard of us. People in our industry have never heard of us. So we're a software company. We don't make the products that you see on the show. We make the software that the companies here are using to design, develop, visualize, simulate, and in many cases, manufacture and deliver to retail some of the products that you are potentially looking at. Uh, we are, make sure I'm going in the right direction. There we are. We are an over $3 billion company. We've been around for 30 plus years. Not very strong on marketing, so people don't know who we are. But if you look around the show, if you're looking at uh, glassware, tableware, cookware, uh, small furniture, and anything in the realm of small appliances, that's where we play. We have about 17,000 customers in the home and lifestyle industry and a lot of brands that I can't publicly mention, but people like Arc and Bernardo Crystal and Bosch, Electrolux and LG, uh, many, many brands here at the show, Seb, for example. And so we have, uh, in our portfolio, we have 12 different brands. And so when you think about uh, consumer social and sentiment analysis and using big data to make smarter products, thinking about what the consumers are looking for, design, development, engineering, simulation, taking that potentially directly into manufacturing, making molds, tuning products, that's the space that we play in. And our corporate mantra is very much uh, tied to some of the trends that are emerging, which is our goal is to manage sustainable innovations to harmonize product nature and life. We believe very strongly, like, like the, the last presenter who was up here, uh, you know, you have to change the world by changing the way people manage in the world. We do not have unlimited resources. We cannot continue to consume and do things the way we do. So making uh, more sustainable packaging, making bottles out of corn products that can decompose instead of turning into ocean plastics, that's the kind of projects that we like to work on with our customers who are making the packaging, who are making the, the cosmetics or the um, foodstuffs that you're eating or the industrial equipment that's making those things. So that's a little bit about who we are. An example of the kinds of product categories that we're into. My role in the company, I work on business process consulting. And so I have a 30 year background working in the industry. This is the first and only software company I've ever worked for. And my goal is to understand what is working today with consumers? What's not working? But more importantly, where are things going in the future? Because if you're thinking about what you want to put in your store, you're looking out at the next season or maybe another year or two ahead. If you're a brand manufacturing for retailers, you're thinking a few years ahead at what you want to put into your product line. We're a software provider. We have to think about where is, where are, is, the market, the consumer demand going to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years, so that we can develop and code the software that will support developing the products that will meet consumer needs of the future. And it is happening incredibly much faster all of the time. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was a report that we had commissioned from Frost and Sullivan together with a survey of about 1,200 uh, people worldwide in preparation for the Consumer Electronics Show where we presented, uh, like I said, two months ago now. Time flies. And what was fascinating to me is that some of the trends that emerged from that were things that I had seen last year here at the International Home and Houseware is shown, particularly in the Smart Pavilion, because we all think of, and it isn't even called the Consumer Electronics Show anymore, actually, this is the first year they've just renamed it CES. Uh, and we said, looking at what we saw this year, it has truly morphed into the Consumer Experience Show. It's finally not just for geeks and drones and, and games, it's really about how do consumers want to experience the world differently and how do products need to change. And it was cool to see the bell taxi helicopter there, but there were a lot, also a lot of home-related products. And so three of the things I'd seen last year, and I encourage you to walk the show and, and, and look for things that are emerging, a lot of focus on the connected kitchen and where is that going and what does that mean to different people. A lot of focus on digital health tied to aging because there's both the millennial growth and actually the fastest growing segment is the segment of the population over 50. Um, and at the same time, 
there was a lot of focus on voice as the next user experience. And I was fascinated because I'd seen that at, at, CE, at, at NRF, and I'd seen it here, and I went back and I was evangelizing it to people that we have to help our customers make products with more voice embedded and voice connection uh, because it's a, it's a growing trend and everybody's like, mm, not so sure. It was everywhere at CES. Everything is voice enabled because it's, if you're making a device to make my life more convenient, my hands are busy, I, I want to be able to just use my voice. And so that was some of what we'd seen here last year. And again, kudos to the Smart Home Show. Thinking specifically about this report, I'm gonna cover a few of the, the key trends that we did see. A big change in consumer values. So millennials by far are the group who consume the most organic produce. They have a very high expectation about sustainability and circular economy being built into their products and built into the products that they want to buy. And they want to know a lot about what's in that. So if you think about food, it's, it's farm to fork. You know, and the clothing expression is, is sheep to shelf. And so the more you can tell them about your products and the provenance of your products, they want that kind of information. And it's not just about the, the, the sustainable journey, but the whole journey of the product, because they're used to seeing that. And I give kudos to Beta for making that information available. I was looking at the products and playing with the information. It's the kind of self-service that we all have come to expect. And the more you can give them that information, the better. The other thing that's happening is, because they're looking for that information, they somehow feel more comfortable with local and niche brands than they ever have before. And I think that puts pressure on global players to stay relevant and stay connected to these consumers. And I mentioned the, the cooking revolution. And so there is a, a real movement towards eating at home. We've reached the tipping point in roughly 2017, 2018, where the cost of eating out has gone significantly above the cost of eating at home. They were fairly close for a number of years. And when you think about convenience, people were into that. But eating out has gone up as the cost of labor has gone up. Eating at home has actually come down in proportion. And it's interesting that the millennial generation, 82% would prefer to eat at home. The problem is they don't know how to cook. And one of the reasons for that is the, the skills of cooking skipped a generation. Uh, women went into the workforce. Women didn't have as much time to cook at home. Easy options were not available. Prepared foods became more attractive, more affordable. And home ec classes were eliminated from schools. And so people don't have the skills. And it's fascinating to me, um, my children did not really take an interest in cooking. My grandchildren are fascinated by it. And they're in their early teens and they, they want to know how to cook. And so this is, this is growing. So the interest is there, the skills are lacking. So if I have a preference for healthy cooking, what are my options? And meal kits went very nicely into that niche, thank you very much, but that's not the be all and end all because someone has done that for you. Where's the creativity? What we see emerging is I have a smart device in my home. And increasingly, that smart device can search through voice, find me recipes. That is happening a lot today. So what's next? What do we see happening in 2030? And the whole Youngly and, and KitchenAid kudos, because they're, they're seeing this happening. But I want my smart device to know what's in my fridge. My fridge knows what's in my fridge. My new smart fridge knows what it's got. So I want my smart device to check what's in my fridge and let me know what recipes I could make tonight with what I have. And if that doesn't pique my interest, then tell me what ingredients I'm missing. And if I say, okay, then trigger my order for pickup at a convenient point on my journey home, because my smart device knows what my logical journey home is gonna be. And I will pick up my, my ingredients. When I get home and I assemble those ingredients according to the recipe on my smart device, it will turn on my smart oven, smart ovens already exist, to the appropriate temperature for the appropriate cooking time. So I still own the creativity but I have assistance when it comes to the skills. And oh, by the way, when food is getting near ready, send a note to everybody else in my family's mobile device that dinner's about to be served and get yourself off your other computers and down into the kitchen. 
because everybody looks at their text messages, they don't necessarily hear mom calling, right? The other, the other thing we're seeing is the idea of being connected. We take for granted that we are a connected uh, generation, that we are connected society. But the speaker just before me was showing the impact of that in, in countries in Africa. And so when you think about the total global population, five connected devices per person in 2030. That's, that's a huge, and that could be the fridge, that could be the stove, all connected to my central hub that, that understands as much about me as I'm willing to share. These are very, very demanding consumers, and they increasingly want products that are um, aligned to their needs, deliverable anywhere, anytime, but increasingly made for me. And so personalization and customization is going to become huge. If you walk around the show, you see a lot of retro colors this year. They're coming back. And a lot of options are being shown how you can change color plates, et cetera. But that means I, as a retailer, or I, as a brand, have to hold that inventory. The changes that are happening in the materials being used for 3D printing, additive manufacturing, will allow a lot more manufacturing on de demand to be real. We're already working with Echo Footwear as an example, not, not a home brand, but Echo Footwear. You can walk into one of their, their um, flagship stores, have your feet scanned, walk a few steps with a sensor. In one hour, they will print you a customized midsole based on your walking pattern and your foot needs and you walk out of the store. Small upcharge, 10% upcharge, something like that for it. Not in the US yet, but it's coming soon. It's already in France, already in Japan, already in, in um, Belgium. So this is, this is happening in terms of demanding consumers. I mentioned already they're very digital, but they're also getting increasingly concerned about data privacy. So if I have to connect to a dozen different devices to get things done, and I have to share my data with every one of them, what am I getting in return other than marketing? Are you giving me value in return for my exchange of data? So you have to think about what is that value proposition, whether you're a brand or a retailer, what is it that you're giving in return for what you're asking from the consumer? Because the, the GDPR protections in Europe are just the tip of the iceberg. Consumers themselves are going to start protesting very soon. So think about how you build that into your, your retail uh, customer service applications or even your, your brand warranty programs. The other huge change that's coming is the sharing economy. Now we all know Airbnb and Uber and Lyft. The sharing economy is expected to be over 300 million by 2025. And some different examples. So who buys a cookbook anymore? You go online and you Google a recipe for a thing that you're interested in. It could be roast beef or what to do with fennel. And in a lot of cases, those recipes have been uploaded by other people who like to cook. That is a perfect example of the sharing economy. Something else that's happening though, Ikea, is getting into renting of furniture. Interesting business model. So instead of buying the furniture for your student, student's apartment that gets thrown out onto the curb at the end of the season, rent and let it go back and have another life at the end of the season or a small office or your first apartment. It speaks very well to the sustainable economy. It's a great value proposition for IKEA. And oh, by the way, a nice way for them to upsell and continue a relationship with those customers. But here's another example. I was shocked. There are now several companies that will rent you all of the tableware and glassware and cutlery and place settings that you need to host a party. You like to cook, host a gathering. What's even nicer, most of them, when you're done, you don't even have to clean the stuff. You put it back in the box and you ship it back to the company. That is a great service proposition and a great way of encouraging people who want to increasingly cook and entertain at home. So think about this as you look at your own brand assortments. Do the products that you offer need to have an online life the same way they have an offline life in someone's home? Now, the, the products aren't smart, but the services being built in are smart. And these are hugely changing the way people will consume in the future. Urban is the other big trend. 60% of the growth, the GDP growth, will come from megacities. A megacity in this definition is over a million people, of which there are over 100 cities like that in China today. There are many cities over 10 million already today. And moving into cities changes a great deal about the things we need 
and the space in which we have to use those things. So, you know, it's not just about getting rid of the things you love because they don't give you joy anymore. It's about what do you buy versus what do you potentially share when you need. Uh, I think people will be far more interested in using products that they can share long before they get into having a self-driving car. Could be, it could be a self-driving bus, could be a self-driving bike, could be the bus that goes around a, a predefined route. Feels very different. I might be quite willing to put a very formal dinnerware together and share that before I'm willing to get on the beautiful Bell helicopter air taxi, just because of how we relate to those kinds of technologies. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, millennials are a very large growing segment of the population, but the fastest growing is 50 plus. So when you think about digital health and aging, when you think about your products, look at both ends of the spectrum there, because there will be two very big bumps uh, of, of consumer types who are looking at this information. They are, they are digital natives, so they're very used to looking for and they want to find information online readily available and consumable and they're thinking about how to live in those spaces. And so if I tie it back to the prior slide, I can also use an IKEA app to visualize that furniture in context of my space. Come on. I can also configure my kitchen robot. So what features do I want to have on that? What colors do I want it to come in? Do I want the large size or the small size? So I can, I can put together how I want that to look and I can increasingly visualize that in 3D virtual rendering. Now I want to see it in context of my kitchen. That could be my kitchen. Or maybe I have a smaller kitchen. Or maybe I want to see it in context of my entire house. And I'm showing you these images because these are not real, these are 3D renderings. And this is the quality when I, I'm, when I talk about 3D rendering and what that means. A lot of companies today are designing and developing products in 3D. And frequently at the back end, they are developing beautiful sales and marketing collateral in a different 3D program to be able to use for e-commerce. And that's a break in the process that adds time. If the consumer expects everything to be getting faster and faster and faster, what will increasingly happen is those models will evolve and I will be able to reuse and repurpose them with much, much easier and simpler technologies, which is the kinds of things that we are working to continue delivering and developing so that I can go from my engineering model to quick consumer validation before I ever have to commit to production. Now I know whether I have a winning product or a losing product and I can allow the consumers to, to give me that kind of precious feedback to understand uh, what I should take to market in the first place, or how much of it, or at what price point. And there's bits and pieces of these things all in the market today, so this is not radical reinvention. This is the evolution that we see happening very, very quickly. Because what we really want to get to is allowing you to imagine your space, allowing you, you as a brand to have beautiful representations of your product, and you as a retailer to help the consumer put together and configure exactly what they want to have in their home, making you the most convenient place to shop from brands that they know and love. And so again, I get very excited by all of this because it's, it's fun to envision, but also to participate in, in helping bring these things to life and, and working on how will the future be different.